like sit down and have a coffee in a crockery cup. Don't do takeaways. Sit down, enjoy it for five minutes. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 268. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. Each week, we are bringing you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we have Sarah Wilson back on the show. This is actually her third time on the podcast, and this was such a great conversation. For those of you that don't know Sarah, she's a New York Times bestselling and number one Amazon bestselling author, former journalist and founder of iQuitSugar.com, which is Australia's largest digital wellness site. Her latest project is Simplicious Flow, released in October 2018. At 348 pages, this non-normal cookbook is the first zero-waste cookbook in the world. Today's interview is based on the principles of this new book. As Jesse said, this is the third time we've had Sarah on the show, and every conversation we have with Sarah is always well-received, and we always have the best time recording with her. The first time Sarah was on, we talked all about sugar. The second time, we talked about anxiety. And today, we are getting into all things food waste, which is a topic we haven't covered yet on the podcast. So we're super excited to share this with you because there is so many great tips, a lot of things that Jesse and I are taking into our life to make our food waste and management of it much better. So here is some of what we talk about today. We talk about how 50% of food waste is contributed by consumers, how to reuse the same piece of parchment paper over and over again, what the freezer challenge is, how to make your own reusable cup, dealing with fridge waste, how to store produce properly, making a stock from your scraps, the difference between composting and recycling, and how to avoid online shopping and support local. Lots of great things that you guys are going to learn today with Sarah. We're so excited to bring this very new conversation to the podcast all about food waste. Here we go with Sarah Wilson. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Welcome back to the show. Oh, hi, guys. It's lovely to talk to you again. Great having you back on the show, Sarah. And I want to start off by getting into something I saw on your Instagram feed, your latest post. And you talk about how you haven't slept in weeks, leaving you feeling unconnected. And this led to you leaving your wallet on a bus. So I'd just love for you to share this story and what you learned from it. Oh, my goodness. That was like less than 12 hours ago. You quick, aren't you? (laughs) We try and be. (laughs) Yeah. From our last podcast, your listeners would know that I grapple with incredible anxiety and it flares up and it's summer here in Australia and I know that my mania flares up. So I've not been sleeping really for about three months and it's just, it takes every iota of my mental and psychological and spiritual strength just to sort of stay functional, you know, and that is my aim. Yeah, it gets the better of me. And yesterday I was ratty, I was rattled, I was on a bus and I actually kind of in my mind's eye saw myself leave my wallet on the bus. It was slow motion. And of course, you know, I then had no wallet, no keys. I had to break into my garage, get my bike and then chase the bus. And I got all the way up to the interchange and missed the bus by one second as it headed back the other way. And of course, I did what everyone does in such circumstances. I sat down in the gutter and cried. (laughs) But what was the wonderful thing, and this is what I shared, is a tourist had found my wallet and he emailed me. And by the time I got the email, it was sort of 15 minutes later. And he said, look, I'll drop it at your office because you've got your business card here. And I said, oh, look, I won't be there. We went backwards and forwards on email because he had no phone, which was refreshing in itself. And He said, look, I've got off the bus. I'm going to get on another bus and head back to Bondi Beach and I'll meet you at the McDonald's next to the discount pharmacy. And he was there in 10, 15 minutes and he was just so beautiful. He insisted on meeting up with me and I just cried because I was so grateful. I'd had such a terrible day. And to have a moment of a stranger's selflessness where he just said, look, this has happened to me before and I want to do the right thing. So it was a really beautiful moment. And I noticed this morning, it's got more hits, you know, likes than any post I've done in weeks. And it's because I think these kinds of stories where people just do simple acts of selflessness for no recompense are what we're craving right now. And I think the fact that he had had that experience made it more real. You know, you get so many people in the same situation and they're faced with, well, do I just take the cash and dump the wallet or do I go one step further? 
So Sarah, this is your third time back on the show, and we've covered a lot of ground each time. The first time we talked about sugar and I quit sugar. The second time we talked about your beautiful book, First We Make the Beast Beautiful and Anxiety. And today's conversation is going to focus in on zero waste and food waste, such an important topic. And you've just created this beautiful, simplicious flow book. So first question I have to ask you is, how did you get interested in the concept and you know, the topic of food waste and zero waste? I've grown up all my life, Marnie, I suppose, with this ethos drummed into me. My parents didn't have a lot of money and we grew up out in the country and we just lived this way. And it wasn't because mum and dad were hippies or progressive. They just had no money and it just made sense to live this way. And there was no rubbish collection service. They could only afford the gas to go into town once a week. So what food mum bought on a Thursday had to last until the following Thursday. And so every single scrap was used. And, you know, I've had a history of working in massive consumerist environments like Cosmopolitan magazine. You know, I was the editor there and I've worked in television and media and fancy realms, you know, of consumption. And I suppose I've always held my same approach. And it's not because I'm trying to make a stance. It actually is the simplest, most elegant, most efficient and real way to live. So, you know, I ride a bike everywhere. I don't own a car. And for me, it's way more efficient. I get my exercise, my fresh air, my thinking time, my freedom, as well as faster transport, you know. And Simplicious Flow, I suppose, in many ways, is the book I've always wanted to write. But, you know, making scraps and leftovers sexy is pretty hard if you don't have an audience, you know, and they don't trust that you can write some decent recipes and be legit. So (laughs) it's kind of the book I wanted to write eight years ago when I first wrote I Quit Sugar. And it's my biggest book. It's 348 recipes. And it is the world's first zero waste cookbook because the making of it was zero waste. So I didn't use any plastic. Every food scrap was used. I got an extra fridge on set. So as we were making the recipes, I would freeze everything as I'm encouraging the reader to do. Like most things in the book can be frozen and reutilized. So if we had to make a peach crumble in like February. I use the muffins that we made in December that are still in the freezer as the crumble. I went, oh, let's use that. And in the book, I show people that you can just use a muffin from the freezer, crumble it up, fry it up in a little bit of coconut oil, maybe add a little bit of cinnamon and there you go. So it was a massive project and I suppose I've lived and breathed it all my life. And it's, it's my final cookbook, you know, and so it was important that I did something that was not normal and actually shook things up a bit and actually got everyone talking about what is a way more important topic. I mean, a lot of people don't realise, and if I can get a little bit fact and nerdy with you just now. Please do. Yeah, I'll try not to bludgeon everybody who's listening to this. I try to keep it a gentle invitation more than a draconian edict, you know. Food waste is actually sort of looming as one of the biggest environmental problems facing the planet. So if food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of CO2 emissions in the world. So that's after China and the US. I mean, that is incredibly significant. And I think the more significant thing is that we feel defenseless. We don't know what to do. We're waiting for governments to make some dramatic changes, you know, because the planet is in serious crisis. The IPCC has come out with a report where they've basically put the alarm bells on and it's the first time they've done it. And 2050, it's not looking good. But anyway, what I feel about food waste is 50% of food waste is contributed by consumers, us. We are the biggest contributors to food waste. So it's not like the government, it's not the supermarkets, it's not industry, it's not some big, bad multinational out there. It's us. It's all of us. And so I actually find that really empowering. It's a bit like the sugar debate. You know, you guys probably remember and some of your listeners would remember when I was talking about I quit sugar. We can sit around waiting for the government to, you know, mandate on maximum sugar amounts in food or we can wait for industry to do a big sweeping change. It ain't going to happen in our lifetime. It's just not. The political interests are just so vested. So what do we do? We get empowered. And over the seven, eight years I've watched this debate, industry and governments changed in response to the consumer. 
So the same thing has to happen with food waste. We can be empowered. We can make a difference. We've got to stop thinking that the government's going to do it for us. That was my rally call. (laughs) You know, you really do live and breathe it. And I love that you share the experience of the whole photo shoot and using the same, you used one piece of parchment paper, the entire photo shoot. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not about throwing things out. And I think we might have even talked about this previously. Many of you would have seen The Minimalists on Netflix, and I don't mean to bag out their work, but it's that sort of minimalist movement is often about chucking perfectly good stuff out, like to achieve some kind of aesthetic goal. And that just makes me want to bury myself under a rock. Like it's terrible. I mean, what we do is we use what we've got. The parchment paper has been made. I've had it for years from years of cooking, inherited it from some photo shoot, and it was there. So we used it. I did make a point of saying we used one sheet and I told the entire team, all right, use it when you really need to and then we wipe it down. And you can get 20 uses out of a piece of parchment paper or baking paper as we call it in Australia before you've got to toss it out. And bear in mind it's not recyclable and it's not compostable. So you've got to use it 20 times to really justify using it. The book, as you would have noticed, is just dripping in layers of tips. My cookbooks are never just recipe, image, recipe, image. You really need to spend almost an hour on each page because I handwrite over the top of things. I share, well, you know, now you can do this. And it's a bit of a choose your own adventure kind of once you've dived in, there's no going back kind of mentality. And that's how I write the book. And that's how I live everything I do. And so that's what I feel is the best way to communicate it in a way that People are going to go, oh, I get it. I want to be part of this. It's what makes it really unique. And those are lasting thoughts. All those little tips throughout the whole book are little things that people have probably thought about or maybe haven't thought about. And it just makes you think twice about all those moves that we make in our own kitchen. Let's talk about the concept of simplicious flow and what that means and how you've infused that throughout the book in terms of the layout, in terms of using the recipes. So I'll just have you explain the title and what your whole method is. The first book in the series was called Simplicious. However, in America and Canada, it actually published as the I Quit Sugar Cookbook, just so that your listeners know. But Simplicious Flow kind of stands alone on its own. It really is about living this way of minimal consumption, not to necessarily be a Pollyanna or, you know, it's not necessarily about making a statement. It really is because we've overcomplicated every aspect of our life. And we need to go back to a pared back, approach where everything flows into the next thing. So recipe books, and I start out by saying this is not a normal cookbook. So recipe books, as everyone knows, it's like a list of ingredients. You go out and get those ingredients. You buy a packet of chia seeds. You buy a bunch of what we call coriander. You call it cilantro. And then you make this one dish and it serves maybe four people, maybe six people at a stretch. And then you pack everything up and you've got half a bunch of coriander, you've got three quarters of a pack of chia seeds, and then you start again the next day with a new recipe and a new list of ingredients. And then you open the fridge and those sad ingredients are looking limp there because you haven't used them up. And it is just inefficient. It is wasteful. It makes absolutely no sense. It creates so much extra work. Like, why are we doing this to ourselves? So People do like cookbooks. They do like to be guided. One of the features of the book is what I call these capsule cooks. So it gives you a shopping list as opposed to an ingredients list. So it's a shopping list of one bunch of broccoli, three onions, five bananas, whatever it is. It's a very tightly contained shopping list. And then it will produce what most people kind of work to. It'll produce three dinners or five workday lunches, or it'll produce an entire dinner party for sort of six to eight people, entree, main and dessert. And so you have just one list and every single thing in that shopping list will be used up to make those dishes. So it's kind of like a menu plan, right? Our grandmothers used to shop and cook that way. They'd buy exactly the right amount. They'd find ingenious ways towards the end of the week to use up the last scraps of things. That's kind of how this book works. I did a massive survey and some of your listeners may have taken part in it because 3,000 people took part in the survey and I got 7,000 comments and questions and things that people wanted solved. So the book answers all of that. I went through all 7,000 comments, 
collated the information and drilled it down. And so there's chapters like how to do Armageddon on your freezer. And freezers are great. They're the most efficient when they're full. So having a full freezer and you put your nuts in there and your nut meals and all the stuff that tends to go around. So store it in there, stuff that you don't use every day, of course, because you don't want to be opening your freezer all the time. But what stops people from doing that is it's generally full of the last crusts of your loaf of bread from five years ago and then a baguette from a dinner party that you didn't quite finish. Like most people's freezers are full of dreggy bits of bread. So I've got a chapter on how to actually clean out all of that bread. And see, we make a hummingbird cake. We make a whole bunch of things that are very usable and can be saved and so on. We touched on the Armageddon challenge there. I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit and explain how you can actually make a game out of fully cleaning out (laughs) the fridge or freezer. Yeah, yeah. Instead of something that I started amongst friends, I actually am the person they'll invite me over for dinner and they actually go, look, I don't think there's anything in my fridge. We can get takeout, but I'll go, no, no, leave it with me. And I will be able to make a meal out of friends' dregs of mustard and frozen peas and all kinds of different things. I mean, that's what I do all the time. And I think that humanity is craving opportunities to be creative and to actually, what I call fending, you know that I'm a mad hiker. I love hiking. And one of the things I love about it is you're out in the raw environment in a very rare situation where you've got to kind of use all your resources, your smarts, your physicality, and you're in the moment. It's such a contrast to the rest of our lives, which is just micromanaged. You can pay for somebody to fix this, sort this. Everything's a mobile phone call or text or download away. So hiking is amazing for fending. And I also love the idea of make a meal out of what you've got as though it's Armageddon. And once you do that, and I find that I can do that for three nights or let's say three meals, and then I go to the supermarket or the farmer's market and I stock back up again. And everything that's in there is fresh. I've had a massive clean out. Everything's ready and clean to start again. That's how our you know, ancestors all used to operate. I think it's not just an obligation to the planet. It's also a psychological obligation that we have to ourselves because we are actually exhausted from just influx and constantly reaching out to sort of the next thing. I feel like this, so I'm going to go and buy all the ingredients from scratch and I can't be bothered to look in the fridge. I mean, it makes us miserable. And that came up in the survey massively. A lot of people, when they were really pressed on it, just went, it makes me feel cringy and guilty. And part of the reason I just go to the shops and buy more ingredients is I actually can't cope with opening the fridge. You know, I don't want to look at all the crap that's in there. It sounds all very serious, but there's a whole heap of really fun things. One thing that you might have noticed, and it seems to have just taken off really strangely with a whole heap of men, like there's a whole heap of sort of really well-known football players, models, celebrities here in Australia who've taken to this task. I've got sort of a bunch of challenges for people so they can work their way through a tick box of challenges throughout the year. But one of them is to make your own takeaway cup, the reusable cup. People go out and buy these things and then they leave them at home and and then they feel really guilty when they see me at a cafe holding a disposable cup. And they look at me, oh, I left my key cup at home or it broke. So I came up with a solution for it, which is really, really simple. You get a glass jar from, you know, your tomato passata or whatever it is, you know, everyone's got glass jars hanging around the kitchen. And then you know all those rubber bands that your broccolini and your herbs and everything come attached in, your kale's always bound up with a rubber band? Well, collect those and wrap them around your glass jar and it becomes the insulator. And it's this kind of multicoloured hand grip and then you've got a lid, you know, from the jar. And it's so satisfying. I see people in the street now carrying around one of their homemade coffee cups So yeah, there's some things like that that just make sense. So I'm doing a couple of campaigns with some cafes here, some sort of fairly popular cafes where I'm going, all right, they want me to come and talk about my book. And I'm like, yep, cool, I'll do it. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to ask everyone to bring a glass jar and some rubber bands. And we're going to do a five minute workshop and everyone's going to walk away with a totally environmentally sound, non-consumable, you know, because quite often stuff in the environmental movement, it's just another thing to buy. Just use what you've got, you know. Everybody's got a large jar that you can drink out of. You know, use what you've got. 
while we're on the topic of rubber bands, I want to talk about your concept of keeping a mangy elastic band on your wrist. And you share in the book how you treat this as a personal challenge. And you even share that one time you were able to keep one on your wrist for five years. So explain what's happening here. You have really read this book. I'm really impressed. Yeah, there's a photo where the photographer caught me at a local cafe. And I'm giving this poor girl next to me a bit of a talk on how much oil and water goes into producing a plastic bottle of water. So (laughs) I am actually quite a painful person to go out with. But yes, on my wrist is the women around the world have got a, an elastic band on their wrist, you know, ready to go and put it in their hair. You can see that it's got all bits of hair in it. But that one I think was a couple of years old. Yes, there was one that my deputy editor at Cosmopolitan gave me when I didn't have a hair elastic. I seriously had it for close on five years. And I do a lot of ocean swimming, you know, I travel around the world and this hair elastic, it just did not give up, you know. And some people might have thrown it out going, oh, well, it's been around long enough and it's a bit mangy. I keep things until they're absolutely unusable. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Sarah to give a shout out to our show partner, Thrive Market. One of the amazing features about Thrive Market is that they're all about giving back. They are on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable to everybody. And when you actually go ahead and buy a Thrive Market membership, you end up donating one to a low-income family, a teacher, veteran, or a student. And they also provide educational content and grocery stipends to their members who have a donated membership. And their whole mission, again, is all about thriving together. And when you do shop online at Thrive Market, you are getting 25 to 50% off of all of the healthy products that are available online. And the best part is that as a listener of our show, you're going to get the opportunity to try out a membership for free for one month, and you're going to get an extra 25% off your order and free shipping. All of that at Thrive Market. To take advantage of this incredible deal, all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and put your first order in today. You are going to love their lineup of products. And now a shout out from our other show partner, Perfect Keto. I'm super excited. We just got some MCT oil powder from Perfect Keto back in stock in our house. We've been out of it for almost two months, so that is way too long to go without this stuff. What I love about it is that it's got this creamy thickness when you add it into an elixir recipe. So this morning I added it into a matcha latte and it was so delicious. It makes it creamy and frothy and we're getting the benefits of the MCTs, which is medium chain triglycerides. And what that does is it allows your brain to focus better and get more energy and you just feel amazing. So if you haven't tried the MCT oil powder, I highly encourage you add it to your cart today. You're going to love it. Such an upgrade, such a wonderful thing to add into the mix. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. These products ship worldwide, free shipping in the US. Go and get yours today. And now back to our chat with Sarah. And Sarah, earlier you touched on hiking and how that's such a passion of yours. I'm curious, when you're out for hikes, are you ever foraging, like looking at what you're hiking through and maybe collecting, I don't know, dandelion greens and coming back and making a salad with those? Or are you into foraging? I have done a little bit of it. When I had the I Quit Sugar business, you know, we used to get some people in to show us new skills. And so we go and do a little bit of that. Uh, Nasturtiums are really rampant here. They're pretty much everywhere, sort of semi-tropical here in Sydney. And so I use a lot of those. But no, I don't tend to. Australia is a little bit different. I go out into the Australian bush, which is quite arid. Around here, it is semi-tropical, but still it's not like Northern Europe and North America where you have four seasons, which essentially mean that in spring you have this influx of new growth and these fresh herbs and, as you say, dandelion greens and all that kind of thing. Here in Australia, it's a tougher climate. And I've done a bit of that stuff out in the desert, but you really got to know what you're doing. Most people would look at it and go, that's just a whole heap of dirt. You know? <laughs> I want to get back into fridge waste and freezer waste, but mainly the fridge and utilizing our produce and maximizing that. I think this is a big area of 
concern for a lot of people because they're either overbuying or they're throwing out a lot because they just don't know what to do with their scraps. So let's just talk about how we can manage some of the produce in our fridge and really maximize its shelf life. Yeah, yeah. Well, the big thing I think is storage. A lot of people just don't know the proper way to store their fruit and vegetables. So the way I tend to shop, I'll go and do a shop for a couple of days at a time. I think a lot of people shop that way. Big families, not so much, but even so, this can work. So I'll do a big shop at a farmer's market or a local sort of fresh produce place. And I come back and I fill my sink with water and I basically wash everything so that it's prepared, you know, like the food is ready to go. The more accessible you can make food, the better. So things like um, my silver beet and my kale, I'll just get a big steamer going, you know, and I'll steam it up immediately. I live on my own. I have friends over for dinner a fair bit, but I can't get through a massive bunch of silver beet, you know, within a couple of days. So I steam it up, chop it up, steam it up to about 60% cooked, just enough to make it change colour, take it out, let it drain and cool. And I put into containers of, you know, one to two serves and I freeze it and it preserves the enzymes. So it's perfectly ready to go. I do that with broccoli, especially if broccoli is on sale. I'll buy a whole heap of it, just chop it up all in one go, steam it to 60, 70%, freeze it. And I have like little florets ready to throw in a stir fry, throw in a smoothie if I have to into a salad. So my freezer has just got a whole heap of stuff that, you know, if I'm not going to eat it in the first couple of days, it's there, it's ready to go. Same with cauliflower rice. I'll put that through a grater and you just store it raw and it's ready to go. You can make a risotto, you can chuck it into soup. I'll do a bit of that. And really this whole process takes me half an hour. I put on music. I'll sometimes ring my dad. My dad talks a lot so I can sort of just have him prattle on while I'm doing it. I then with my sort of herbs and you call it rocket or arugula? Arugula, yeah. Yeah, it's so difficult. Every country is different. I'll rinse all of that out. And the best thing to do with this, collect your old pillowcases and tea towels. They are perfect for this. So herbs and those delicate sort of leaves should all be wrapped in a moist towel or pillow slip. And you can buy these bags as well, but I find you don't need to buy it. You've got some of this stuff lying around. You know, everyone's got old pillowcases that they can't use anymore. So wrap them up and then put them in the crisper or put them into a large plastic container. Never, ever store these things in plastic bags. They've got a shelf life of about two days if you do. And so one of the big things you'll note in the book, the big sort of gap on the page where I've bought my produce and it goes, this is the spot where bagged greens would go. So I'm talking, you know how you go to the supermarket? And I know in America, you've got them everywhere. Your spinach leaves, your salad leaves will be in a plastic bag in the supermarket ready to dump into a bowl. The thing is, they last literally 24 to 48 hours before they go slimy. I mean, it's just terrible. And that's what 72% of people chuck that out every week. Are you talking about the pre-washed ones? Exactly. So the best way to make something green go slimy is to have it wet and put into a plastic bag. You know, it is a recipe for disintegration. And that's what supermarkets do. And that's how a lot of people buy their greens. So don't do that. Store it in a some sort of cloth in your crisper, and you'll find that that will last one to two weeks without a problem. I buy organic when I can, but I don't buy everything organic and a lot of families can't afford to. But if you do, you will find they'll last longer and therefore it's you know more bang for your buck. So do that with your greens. I have a crisper that's set aside for all of that. You then sort of ensure that you store your fruit away from a lot of things that can go off. So fruit contains a molecule that will actually make other vegetables go rotten. So, you know, don't put other vegetables in your fruit bowl with your fruit, unless, of course, you are trying to ripen an avocado. Put it with next to your bananas and your apples and that will make it ripen faster. The other thing is bananas. If they're on special, which they often are at certain times of the year, buy a whole heap and there's a couple of things you can do. Obviously, leave them out on the bench if they're almost ripe or you're going to eat them soon. But if it's starting to go brown and you're busy and you're worried that it's not going to last, put it in the fridge. It'll last a good extra couple of days and the skin will go brown, but the inside is in perfect form. And the other thing, of course, is to peel them and then break them into pieces and put them into a container in the freezer and chuck them into smoothies. But, you know, I've got a recipe in the book for one ingredient banana ice cream. And I tell you, it is the most lush, 
super sweet ice cream you'll ever have. This is the other thing about fruit. It tends to taste sweeter when frozen. So if you've got some tropical fruits and you're not going to get to it, chop half of it up and freeze it. Things like pawpaw or papaya and rock melon or melons, they do super well in the freezer and you pull out a chunk and it's like eating candy. And kids love it, you know, they suck on it and it tastes heaps sweeter than it would normally. So yes, the first half of the book is I walk people through this entire process from beginning to end. And it can take half an hour, it can take a little longer if it's, you know, a big shop. Then it saves me so much time during the week. I've got food ready to go, it's sitting there in containers, already sort of prepared. I mean, we put a lot of effort into, for instance, taking the green bits off our strawberries. Why would you? Either you eat around it, but a lot of people put their strawberries into smoothies. The green bit's fantastic in smoothies. Kiwi fruit is exactly the same. There's no need to peel it. Just chuck it in your smoothie and it disintegrates and the fiber's fantastic. There's a whole lot of things like that. I'm like, why do we peel it? Why do we go to all of this effort when we don't need to? And another great tip you have too is collecting all your veggie scraps and keeping it for a stock or a soup stock and not even just putting it to the compost, utilizing it so you can actually bring that into a new meal. Exactly. A lot of people go, oh, you know, I compost everything. And that's great. But if you can actually repurpose it first, I have a container where my celery leaves, odds and ends of some vegetables, some stuff that I think, oh God, I'm not going to get to that quarter of an onion that I've left aside. I put it straight into this container in the freezer and it just fills up, fills up, fills up. And then when I'm making a big roast chicken meal or I've made a casserole with chicken thighs, I keep all the bones and I often put them in the freezer in the same container. And when I'm ready to, I just dump it in a big saucepan with a splash of white vinegar, some bay leaves and maybe some peppercorns. And I just boil it up for 24 hours, you know, and then you have the best ever stock. I go that one step further <laughs> and then grab the mushy vegetables that are left behind. So sometimes it's really beautiful stuff and you can turn that into like a scoopable stock paste, mix it with salt and it becomes this stock paste that you can keep in the freezer and it'll last for six months. It's full of the nutrients and the flavor and you'd be amazed. It's exactly like a stock paste that you would buy from a supermarket. Yet it's taken you five seconds to make, it's cost you nothing, and you've, you know, saved a whole heap of stuff going into landfill. I love that. Is there anything that ends up in the compost with you or do you end up utilizing all of your produce? <laughs> you know what? I got asked that question and people love to catch you out, right? When you, you put out a bold statement and look, I say, I'm not fallible, you know, I live a busy life, I'm traveling a lot, so I've got to... It does make it a little bit difficult at times. But somebody said to me, I bet you anything you throw out banana skins. And I was like, yeah, I do. But then I took it on as a challenge. And probably one of the most popular recipes in the book is my banana skin cake. So essentially it's banana bread, you know, like the stuff that you have at cafes that's super sweet. And it's got no banana. It's got no sugar. It is literally made with four banana peels. I then went that extra mile and the main public broadcaster, TV broadcaster here, invited me onto this sort of documentary that Warner Brothers was making actually about uh, families and the history of dinner and what families ate throughout the eras. And I went on as representing the future and they asked me to talk about food waste and sugar. And they said, come up with a recipe that's really going to cover off both. So I took the risk of cooking this cake, right, on national television And I was up against the mother who cooked the traditional banana cake with three cups of sugar and three bananas. I mean, really, what chance did I have? However, the kids came home from school and they had to do a taste test. And sure, they did like the sugary one better, but they actually ate mine as well and said, you know what, it's really good. My compost does have stuff in it. It sort of has the last dregs of things. I put my compostable tea bags in there. I put small bits of paper sometimes, like tissues and things like that. I will put the horrible dreggy bits in your hairbrush. I put that in there. But yeah, look, to be honest, my compost is really minimal. Like everything gets used. On the cover of the book, I've got a bunch of asparagus and that bunch of asparagus lasts five months because we used every last bit. I pickled, I fermented, 
you know, the ends of my asparagus I keep as well in the freezer and I keep the rinds of my parmesan cheese. And this isn't an old Italian thing. You talk to any sort of nonna back in Italy, this is what they do. They keep their asparagus ends all throughout summer. They freeze them. They keep their parmesan rinds and then they put together and boil it up into the most lush stock you've ever, ever had. And it's just amazing for risotto, but also for vegetable soups. I find a way to use up most things. And if I was to drill it down, in some ways it comes down to laziness. Like it is easier to use up something and to be in action, if that makes sense, and kind of creating than to kind of find ways to get rid of stuff and block it out and dispose of it and deal with mushy kind of garbage. Like you said before, it's a sport. And when things do need to be composted, you talk about this really interesting compost bin in the book. I want to get the pronunciation right here. I think it's called the Bokashi bin. And this is a composter you can have at home. We hadn't heard of it before your book, but we went and looked into it after. And I think we might invest in one. And it's just really cool because it has a little spout on the bottom. And as it's composting, you get a tea that you can use to put on your plants as they're growing. And you're actually creating compost at the same time. So just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it is an Australian company, but I believe they do sell overseas. And there's probably comparable ones overseas as well. But it's a really simple setup. It's not a big bin. It can fit under your kitchen sink. And as it fills, one version of it has a really great spray that helps it break down a little faster. And the one I use has these sort of chips. It's like, do you just put a handful of these chips in? It absorbs the smell. It just means that you haven't got this really rank smelling compost bin in your kitchen. So it means you can have it in your kitchen. The fluids drain to the bottom. And because it's been composting nicely rather than going really putrid, there's a little valve at the bottom. And once you're sort of finished, you can pour it. You'll get sort of one or two quarts out of it. And then you go and use that as an incredible fertilizer on your plants or your garden. And my plants, I've got sort of pot plants in my house. I live in an apartment building, but we've got a communal backyard. I go and dump it down on sort of the flower beds and they just go mental for it. You know, it's really nutritious. And then, of course, I dig a hole in the backyard. At times, I've been known to go and sort of just find communal sort of stretch of garden outside in the street. And I just dig a hole and put my compost in there and cover it up. And because it's mostly composed by the time it goes in the ground, it's pretty condensed and doesn't really smell and it's a really great way to go about it. Yeah, I think we're going to end up buying one. And I think it's pretty apparent from hearing you talk, especially the way you talk about food and utilizing each and every last bit if you can. But I want to put the point out there that composting and recycling should be a last resort. And you talk about this in the book. So I think a lot of times people feel that, okay, I'm buying this or that, but if some of the product ends up going to waste some of the produce, say, and I compost it, then okay, that's fine. Or I'm buying certain products that are in containers that can be recycled. And it just is a way to kind of let themselves off the hook for wasting or buying different things. So talk about that a little bit, how these two different ways of disposing of things in a better way through composting and recycling are great, but they should be looked at as a last resort. Yeah, look, composting certainly has its benefits because it goes back into the soil and it doesn't produce the same emissions as going to landfill. So, yep, it's fantastic. And that's what you do when you really can't use up the produce for something else. And I guess with recycling, however, I actually make a statement of saying I do not put chapter on recycling in this book because of exactly that reason, Jesse. It's sort of a get off kind of guilt-free kind of out clause, you know, for people? Well, I think it's an out of sight, out of mind thing where you put it in that bin and and somebody comes to pick it up and it's like, okay, it's off my hands and, and that feels great. It's getting recycled. But, you know, what really goes into that process? Well, first of all, there's the whole fact that people forget the manufacturing, what the farmers had to do, what the distributor people have had to do. The amount of work it takes to carry, let's say, an apple or something contained in a recyclable plastic bag, right? The amount of work and manufacturing and carbon miles and oil and the whole thing that goes into bringing that product to you is incredible. So all very well if we're getting rid of it in a somewhat responsible way, but that doesn't excuse the fact that 
it's had to be created in the first place. When it comes to recycling, I know that this is the situation in Canada. I know parts of North America have got this. A lot of the recycling is carted off to third world countries. I know in North America, we were doing exactly the same thing as us. We were carting it off to China and China was taking all of our recycling. They've clamped down. So the US, Australia, we're all facing a very similar predicament. There is nowhere to take our recycling. So this all happened sort of, I think, earlier this year. It was about February this year. I can tell you now, there's councils and governments around the world who are going, we don't know what to do. So in Australia, it's stockpiling. There are massive, massive storage units with recycling banked up, waiting for somebody to come up with a solution. So if you think you're putting your plastic bottle into the recycling bin and it's all good and it doesn't matter that you've bought it in the first place, you're wrong because it's not been recycled. I think it's something like only 6% of plastic on the planet is recycled. So by the time it actually gets to a recycling bin, by the time it gets to a plant and it hasn't been contaminated by, you know, your neighbour who's not managed to put the right things in the right bins, and in most cases it's not getting there, there's a whole range of factors that basically mean only 6% of plastic on the planet is being recycled. It is not a solution. It is a kind of very unsatisfactory Band-Aid. So I just feel that we've got to really take that off the agenda. Recycling is last, last, last resort. And there's a whole heap of things that we're not doing correctly. So if you're throwing some aluminium foil from your chocolate wrapper or whatever it might be in the bin, it can actually clog up a plant because it's too small to pass through and it'll stop that entire bin or that entire load from making it through and so they dump it. So what you've got to do is you've actually got to know that you've got to screw it up into save up your chocolate wrappers, screw it up into a ball at least the size of a golf ball. Otherwise, it will clog up a plant. So there's a whole range of things. We're not being educated on it. It's confusing. We're getting it wrong and so it's not working. The solution, don't buy stuff in the first place, you know, and you stop buying so much stuff by using what you've got. So that's just it's a mentality. We've been sort of seduced into thinking that somebody else will deal with our stuff. I think that most of us know, and when I talk about this stuff, people kind of don't dispute it. They kind of go, I've known this. I've had a creepy, uncomfortable feeling about it. And, you know, people are starting to get it. So those takeaway coffee cups that are everywhere, most of those are not compostable or they're not recyclable because they're lined with plastic so that you don't have boiling water passing through the cardboard. I love that you brought that up. I was actually going to ask about that, where a lot of things we're probably putting in the recycle bin, assuming they're getting recycled, might just end up getting tossed, or I don't even know what they do. I actually, when I go out and I, I'm still guilty of this, I go get a tea or a coffee and I'm out and about and it's in a paper cup, I'll put it in the recycling, assuming that it's going to be recycled. And, you know, you get that feeling where you feel good about that, that you're putting it in the right spot. But, you know, this whole preparing for the interview and having this chat with you is making me totally rethink my position. And I'm going to be, what was it called in Australia? The reusable cup? Keep cup. Yeah. So I'm going to get my keep cup going. Yeah. Or just do the jar version. Get yourself a jar with some elastic bands. Yeah. And it only takes one or two people putting a non-recyclable cup into a recycling bin for that entire bin to be tossed because it cannot go through the recycling plant. The chances of that are happening are pretty high because, you know, you're an intelligent, aware guy and you might not know if your cup's recyclable or not. Most people don't. And then the lid, and this is the other thing, I try to also appeal to people's vanity and their own personal health. Those plastic lids contain BPA. And I know in Canada for a fact, that's been banned in baby's bottles, in a whole range of sort of containers. It's been proven to be highly toxic. And it's most toxic when it's heated. And of course, on a coffee cup, it's been heated and you're sucking it in. You're sucking in that those molecules. It is a highly toxic substance and it's a bit of a loophole that they're still being produced, you know, and people are consuming them in a heated format daily, if not several times a day. If I can't get through to people on the planet point of view, I appeal to their health and vanity. <laughs> For sure. And it's also relevant. Like we've got plenty keep cups at home, actually. So there's no shortage of them there, which again comes back to the consumer problem. So it's just a matter of going one step further. A lot of the times that we're using our reusable cups is when I'm making something and we're going on the go. But 
in Jesse's case, where he's going a lot to tea shops, he's just got to bring it with him. Put it in his backpack, bring it with him, give it to the barista, say, fill this up. And that's the direction I know that's the movement you're pushing towards. And that's what people need to go further on is to bring it with them. And when they're getting takeout food, bring their own glass containers, ask to be filled up in what we've got or mason jars or whatever they have at home. Yes, exactly. And look, there's other things. I go that step further because it's kind of what I do and I know that I get impact and people start to notice. I write about this in the book and it shocks people, but then they go, oh, I kind of get it and people are doing it now. At cafes, you always get given a portion of butter with your toast or whatever and it's too much. What I do is I take it home with me. I put it on my paper serviette and I take it home and I put it in the fridge and people go, doesn't it just all melt? And it's like, no, it doesn't. You actually put it in the fridge and once it's cold, you can just kind of lift it off the paper. I then keep the paper serviettes and I keep them and use them as kitchen towel. And I have to confess, and I've said this previously at a few talks I've done, so I'll I'll tell your listeners, you will be horrified at times when I've been in a situation where I've not had toilet paper in my house. I have had to resort to using these paper serviettes that I've taken from cafes around the world. Buttery as well. (laughs) Well, I choose, I try to get the one. See, I actually collect them all, right? Because people get these paper serviettes, most of the time they don't even use them. And then the waitress or waiter comes along and clears them all up and throws it in the bin. I've just got a big stack in my drawer and some of them are not buttery. Yes. And Sarah, (laughs) don't you sometimes collect the bones and butter of other people as well and bring that home? Aren't you just glad that you don't live in the same country as me and you're not going out for dinner anytime soon? You're loving it. <laughs> yeah, so there's this wonderful re- – look, there's a very, very well-known restaurant here in Sydney and I used to live above it in one of my temporary Airbnb setups when I was, you know, living out of a suitcase. And I wrote one of my books there and the waiters used to look after me and they got very used to this, but they had this big T-bone steak on the menu and I'd sit there working away and I'd see these people eat these T-bone steaks and either they wouldn't finish them or the bone would be left there. I'd go, hey, you know, you could take that bone home and you can boil it up and make an incredible broth and the gelatin's going to be great for your health. And they look at me a bit strange and I say, all right, let me take it home. I'll take it home. And so what I do is I take strangers' beef bones home. Sometimes, and on two occasions I've done this, I've invited them to meet me back there a couple of days later. So I make up the stock and I come back with a jar of the stock for them. And then I say, look, you can find the recipe in one of my cookbooks or on my website. So, you know, I'm trying to convert people, you know, one beef bone at a time. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Sarah to give a shout out to our show partner, Sun Warrior. If you haven't tried Sun Warrior's Soul Good Bars, they are amazing. They're totally plant-based, soy-free, gluten-free, non-GMO, dairy-free, and they are filled with 17 to 19 grams of protein. And they even come in four different flavors, coconut cashew, cinnamon, salted caramel, and blueberry. And Jess, you've been loving the salted caramel lately. I love all four of them. I love having them on hand at all times, having them as snacks in between meals, bringing them on the go. They are fantastic. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior purchases, including the Soul Good Bars. And to take advantage, it's super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. For listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and load up your cart with Soul Good Bars like we do. You can thank us later. Now I'm going to read one of our fabulous reviews coming from Hey Samantha 18 from the USA. It's titled Ultimate Health and Life Podcast, and she gave us five stars. I have loved scrolling through Marnie's Instagram, listening to nutritional tips on their podcast, and of course, learning all things health. I've struggled a lot with body image and acid reflux over the years, so hearing ways to heal my body and eat naturally and feed my body healthy and pure foods is exactly what I needed. Thank you for being such genuine people. Well, thank you so much, Hey Samantha, for checking out my Instagram at Marnie Wassman and for taking the time to leave us this amazing review. We thank each and every one of you who leaves us a review. It means so much to us. Thank you so much for the kind words, Hey Samantha. We really appreciate it. And if you haven't had a chance to leave us a review yet, it's super easy to do. All you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash apple. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash apple. Leaving a review really only takes about 30 seconds and it means the world to us. So thank you ahead of time for taking the time and leaving us some kind words. And now back to our chat with Sarah. 
And Sarah, I want to come back to the jar concept. And we talked about before how you can take these jars, put elastics around them, and actually make your own cups that you can take on the go. And a predicament that we're finding in our household is that we might buy sauerkraut or pickles and different things, and we're not recycling them, and we're just filling the cupboards with them. You know, the cupboards are now at the point where when we're putting the dishes away, some of them have to still be left out on the drying tray, and it's just become quite a problem. So I'm curious, like, instead of recycling them, how do we put these to good use? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I do, I'm short of jars, partly because I don't buy a lot of packaged foods. I don't buy a lot of foods that come in containers. You know, every household has a lot of jars. What I do is I shop at bulk food stores and I know Canada is like prolific with bulk food stores. I take my jars with me. So I have my jars and I generally have, you know, how you've got to write the code down on so that they can put it into the system. I have the code written on the top and it will say what it is, you know, coconut flakes or chickpea flour, whatever it might be. I take my jars straight to the store and I fill them up at the store and they're ready to go home and go straight onto the shelves. So all of my grains, my spices, my things like coconut, tea, I buy all of that at bulk food stores. They are a tenth of the price. So herbs and spices in particular, much, much fresher, much better quality and you know, sometimes a quarter, sometimes a tenth of the price, like that's not an exaggeration. I have everything in jars, everything stored in jars. And then I don't really have Tupperware or plastic containers for my food. And, you know, I mentioned that I saw, you know, my stock vegetables, you know, and I've got all my grains or nut flowers in the freezer. So I store them in glass jars. You've got to be careful you just leave sort of an inch or so at the top. You don't want to overfill, especially liquids. So yeah, they're my storage containers and they're a much better way to store things. They defrost at a more consistent rate and some people do have issues with just plastic containers and do they leach and all of that chemicals and all that kind of thing. Well, cut to the chase and just use your old glass jars. I love that. And I like that you pointed out it comes back to the source as well. So you're just not buying things that are in glass jars. So things like sauerkraut and pickles and there's a lot of the stuff we can learn how to make at home and go that route as well. Yeah, and if you go to a farmer's market, some of that stuff is bought in bulk, right? Just take your jars. Nobody minds. And even going to supermarkets, you know, the deli counters where they've got olives and they scoop up some olives and put it into a plastic container. I take my own containers now. They've got to weigh it anyway. They weigh the container and then they put the produce in there. And I've done some campaigning around that and I've got the main supermarkets here, the major supermarkets to support it. So it's just an efficient way of doing things. And, you know, some people go, oh, but, you know, I can't be bothered. It's going to take a whole heap of changing in my headspace. You know, in our lifetime, seatbelts were not compulsory. Were you alive when they were not compulsory? I might have been really young. I don't remember that. I was really young and we all had to be educated. Same with brushing our teeth. It just becomes what we do. And the same can happen with this. And the more we do it, the more different businesses are going to accept that and make it easier for us as well. Yeah, cafes all around me, I think partly because they're scared of me now, they're now doing initiatives like putting up signs. They get me to actually write a sign that just explains, like sit down and have a coffee in a crockery cup. Don't do takeaways. Sit down and enjoy it for five minutes. People are starting to catch on to it and they're starting to spread the message. Most of the cafes around where I live now charge 50 cents if you want to have a disposable cup. They're charging people 50 cents and they give it to charity, which is even better. Love that. Mm. And while we're on the topic of jars, let's talk about making apple cider vinegar at home. I think this is just something that a lot of us health foodies are using on a regular basis. And this is just a recipe and a way of saving our apple cores and skins. So if you could share that. Yes. A lot of parents face this. You know, you've got lots of apple cores. You might even have apple peels. I personally don't peel my apples, but some kids need them peeled. And so you put them in the freezer or you put them just in the container. Depends on how long it takes you to store up enough. And you can make a very, very easy, simple apple cider vinegar that you can use as you would, you know, for your first thing in the morning or whatever it is you use it for, for deglazing and so on. But it works super well. It's just a really simple ferment with a bit of salt. It sits on the bench for a couple of days and you're sorted. Like it is so simple. You've got so many brilliant ideas like this in the book and they're scattered throughout, but that was one that definitely stuck up for Jesse and myself. Oh, good. 
Yeah, we love it. So just coming back to recycling a little bit and just like excess packaging. So I know it comes down to consumerism. We need to buy less and accumulate less. But for people who are listening who are maybe, you know, it's just like part of their life or they can't control it or even Jesse and I, we're in the situation now with the podcast where we're getting sent stuff all the time. We're ordering some stuff from Amazon. We're getting packages. We're getting boxes. So maybe just some tips on how to utilize what you've got, yeah. kind of giving people just some what they can do with all this scrap extra packaging. And also, you know, just to look towards the future, if you have any ideas or if you have any inkling of where things could go. Like I was thinking today when we got a delivery this morning, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if I could just like give my box right back, unpackage it in front yes. of him, give it right back to him and he could do something with it or send it back to the company. So yeah, just kind of twofold there. Just talk about what do we do with what we have in the future. Well, the first thing I would say is really think about people love online shopping and they think it's changed the world. It certainly has, but it produces so much packaging and I find it abhorrent. So I avoid online shopping as a starting point because it comes with all of that packaging. Buy it at the shop, support local if you can, and make sure you don't get a bag. So I do that. But then when I do have plastic bags, so, you know, your FedEx thing comes into a big plastic bag of some sort, I keep those bags. So I keep them in the same cupboard as my paper serviettes. I use it as a bin liner. So that's essentially what I use them for. So I don't personally feel I need a bin liner. So if I haven't got one of these bags floating about, I will just put it straight into the bin and then we'd rinse it out. It was just simple. And I don't have a lot of rubbish and I don't have a lot of revolting rubbish because everything gets used. You know, I'm not putting old bones or revolting, you know, sort of apple cores in my garbage. So yes, I keep those bags and I use them. Like it's insanity that we get given these bags, we then throw them out, then we buy new bags where we could actually use the bags we've already got for lining a bin, for instance. I buy frozen peas. It's one of the only things that comes in a plastic bag in my house because there's just nowhere that I can buy them otherwise. And I use even that small bag as my little bin liner. It'll only last most families for one meal, but a lot of families are going their big garbage bin on a daily basis anyway. So just start thinking along those lines. Also, takeout as well is a big thing. There's simple things you can do. Go and pick it up and don't get the plastic bags and all of that and take your own containers. So takeaway places are more than happy for you to do it. I do it if ever I'm getting takeout, which is not that often, but I like the walk up the road. Go for a walk, enjoy your evening rather than sort of sitting comatose in front of the TV. Go for a walk with your partner, have a chat, get them to put it into your container or at the very least when you order it, and I know you can do this in the States, is say food only, which means none of the cutlery. You're at home, you've got your own cutlery, no serviettes, no plastic, no blah, 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 just food only. What about boxes and what about like cosmetic containers and supplement containers, things like that? Yeah, they're tricky. So I get my facial oil, my body oil, my shampoo, everything from bulk food stores. I have, you know, old containers and I go and take them in and I fill them up. So I use almond oil on my face and my body. And I tell you what, a liter of the stuff costs a couple of dollars. It is the cheapest body oil. And then I'll just add some rose oil or lavender oil to scent it. Even my deodorant, I buy as a paste and I've got to know the woman who produces it and I just send my containers back and get them filled up. You know, I'll do four at a time. So I just sort of think of those things and you know what, it creates a relationship. I end up having a coffee with somebody, you know, like that's how you meet people and you have interesting conversations. So I try to use it up, you know, my pill containers, you can't use all of those. I repurpose them wherever I can. Boxes are tricky. Again, I just try to avoid buying things. I go for 13 months, nine months at a time without buying anything other than groceries and toilet paper, if I remember. But um, I'm wearing clothes from when I was 18, you know, so I'm 44. Those famous shorts? The famous shorts, yes, the famous shorts. They actually have become a bit of a thing. And in fact, I have to confess, I've worn them for 11 years and I wear them daily, but I'm on my fourth pair. And People have bought them for me because it's become such a joke, you know. They'll go and buy me another pair when the pair I'm wearing have got holes in them and they're indecent, (laughs) you know. So, yeah. But, you know, I'm wearing clothes from literally last century and I look after things. Sometimes they'll get cuffed and I'll shorten the hem. It's quite a lot of freedom in not spending your life at the shops. 
I love it. I love that you're living it. You're breathing it in every element. I feel like we can just kind of throw anything at you, you know, your your beauty care, your clothing, and you've got an answer of how you are doing this. So it's really inspiring, Sarah. Thank you. And I think we could probably talk for another hour, but we will wrap things up. If there was something that we haven't covered yet and something you can leave our listeners with that we haven't tackled or a way to bring simplicity or simplicious flow into their life, what would it be? I would say hike. Get outdoors and hike. And obviously, in your part of the world, it's a wonderful place to hike. And the reason I say it is while ever you're hiking, you're not at the shops. And it's become a real default position for people is to go shopping on weekends when they've got spare time. And that's what people do. And shopping begets more shopping and shopping begets more envy and kind of desire and comparisons with other people and what you have and what they have. I literally find myself out hiking and I don't see the billboards. I don't see the advertisements. I know I was in a train station. I saw some billboards of a girl wearing these really cool looking yoga leggings. And all of a sudden I can feel myself wanting them. If you're not exposed to it, you find yourself not shopping. And I mean, I guess the simple formula is people say to me, oh, how do you live your minimal way? And I say, it's really easy. I just don't go to the shops. I just don't go to the shops. (laughs) Well, that's a common thread throughout this whole interview, going back to the root, not going to the shops and, you know, not consuming when we can avoid it. So it's miserable. It's boring. It's addictive. It keeps us in a trap, you know, and you just sort of find yourself not going to the shops and then you go, do I need to go up there and buy another pair of underpants? No, I'll just put that off for a bit longer. I'll see if I can go another two months without having to go and buy a new pair of socks or whatever. You find that you just don't need it. It's just kind of really finding freedom from not being near shopping venues. Well, Sarah, other than listeners getting a copy of your brand new book, Simplicious Flow, which as you mentioned in the opening of the interview, it is a big book and it is absolutely beautiful and your creativity pours onto every page. It's just a fantastic read. So congrats on that. We definitely want the listeners to get a copy of that. And how else can they connect with you? Yeah, I should just say for your listeners at the moment, it's available as an ebook. So go as an ebook, and it's a beautiful ebook. You guys got a copy of it. So go onto your favorite, whether it's Kindle or iBooks or whatever, it's there and it'll be in print form in a month or two. It looks like you had a lot of fun making it too. I did. <laughs> I did. Well, thank you, Sarah, so much for coming back on for round three. We hope there's going to be a round four down the road. Yes. And yeah, we're just so excited. We can't wait to get our hands on the hard copy. Thank you so much, guys. And I love talking to you and the crew. You've been very supportive. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Sarah. So many great tips on how to manage your food waste and waste in general better. I know Jesse and I are coming away from this conversation with so many practical things we're going to implement into our life. And we're certainly going to be more mindful as consumers. Be sure to let us know over on Instagram what you think of today's episode. We're at Ultimate Health Podcast and Sarah is at underscore Sarah Wilson underscore. Let us know what you think. We can't wait to hear. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 268. We're going to have links to everything we discussed in a nice show summary. So be sure and check those out. And before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thanks for doing such a great job putting the show together. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that him and his fiance Edith are moving to Prague this week. Congrats on the big move and wishing you guys all the best on the next chapter. Listeners, have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.